Hi, and thanks for joining us. We are now releasing our What's on the Telly supporter only show to the public. We are releasing it three months later than our premieres on our supporter sites through Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee. So this month we have the show Evil. We're reviewing season one. Uh, this originally aired in August of 2021 for our supporters. So if you'd like to join us for What's on the Telly coming out as soon as possible, you can find the links below. Thank you for being a supporter and thank you for watching Lee and I on the Black Hat Chat. We love hearing from you and we will see you on Fridays at 4 p.m. GMT for our regular chatting time. But now, let's get into what's on the telly. Hello to all of our members. Right, so we're going to start doing an exclusive. And what we're going to be doing is uh, just reviewing uh, TV series and movies which are magic and witchcraft related. And uh, giving our opinion, really, because we like to be opinionated sometimes. We have to be because, you know, we're witches. Um, we are going to call this segment "What's on the Telly," so let's get be well. Let's begin. <laughs> <laughs> so, for our first one, we are going to review the Netflix show "Evil," uh, which has one season out with thirteen episodes, and they've said there's a second season coming. The trailer has mm. been released, so uh, hopefully, if this is successful. We'll be back to review the second season. But right now we're just talking about season one because that's all that's out at the moment. Yeah. Season two is actually has actually started. It's on episode six, I think. Oh. But not on not on Netflix. Netflix, I think, might be a bit behind. Yeah. And it's not on Netflix South Africa, which is quite horrific. Don't know why they do that. I thought this was a Netflix show. Apparently not. No, I think it's uh, CBS, I think. Oh, HBO, CBS, okay. Yeah. Mm. All right. So, the, the, the series Evil is basically about a priest and a psychiatrist. Psychologist. Uh, the, sorry, psychologist, psychologist. Um, those are the two main characters. Um, now, the priest is a priest in training but he gets called out to do or to to assess um uh, 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 uh forgotten the word forgotten the word phenomenon phenomenon and possessions That's the well one. they do some possessions they do some uh, infestations they do some miracles just all the things where the catholic church may need to intercede or uh, give an official stamp so mm. and in real life this is what assessors for the catholic church do uh yeah. they go out anytime somebody says i think this person is possessed i think my house is haunted um i think i said you know there was a i witnessed a miracle that's what happens is the catholic church sends out an assessor and they review the situation and report back and then the church decides yes it officially is um, a phenomenon or not mm. and most often the answer is not there's a lot of criterion for the mm. for the situation to meet for the church to say yeah this happened yeah what i actually like about the whole thing is that the the team they put together so you've got the priest uh, and then you've got ben who is muslim i think he seems to come from a Muslim family, although there's like some indications in the show that maybe he doesn't practice. There's a scene yeah. where his sister's like, uh, dad's asking if you're coming in for prayers and he just looks at her and his sister's like, yeah, I know, but he has to try, right? So seemingly Ben has not been praying uh, with his family or attending the mosque for quite some time. Mm. Yeah, so he's a complete non-believer to begin with. Uh, so he goes around and checks for technical things, for construction. Um, you know, if pipes are rattling when you know, it's making a noise and people are thinking it's, it's an infestation or something like that. 
Um, then yeah, he the, really, like, he really yeah. jack of all trades it. He looks at all sorts of things. Mm. No, he does. He does. Uh, I, he, I think at one one stage, he, somebody asked him what he does, and he says he's a uh, contractor. That was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good way to explain it. Yeah. And then the psychologist, who is an ex Catholic, so has rejected uh, the Catholic faith altogether. Um, and so she comes in as an impartial observer to give the the other side of the story really so just to check the um the mental health of the person as opposed to the priest who is checking for the spiritual aspect um so it, it it's I, I find this i find this interesting because it's not one of those tv series that kind of just focus completely on it is this or it isn't that um you know it, it gives an impartial view as well it examines the psychology of some of this stuff, um, it all, but it also examines, um, you know, things that uh, could be done physically in order to affect the changes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is the way that the, the church approaches assessments like that. If there is mm. some other explanation, then it's not a possession, a miracle, an infestation, a haunting, whatever it is. Um, but there is a point in the show where the psychologist says, you know, the, the, not the main priest, David Acosta, the character, uh, but the priest he's reporting to that's giving him his assignments, that priest says, um, you know, is there anything else psychology could do here? And the psychologist, the character Kristen Bouchard says, Yes, psychology always thinks there's more, but if we don't act, something bad is going to happen. The church needs to act here. So mm. she's, she even says, you know, I don't really think this is the devil or a haunting or a possession or whatever, but you have the ability to act. And the in this situation, the parents have already exhausted a great deal of medical and psychological intervention and now want something else because they're at their wit's end. Mm. So that's an interesting uh, point of view that the the psychologist is not just hardline, the church can never do anything, there's nothing helpful there, you know, kind of thing, which is a really interesting position for a character that is a lapsed Catholic you know and there later in the show her husband asks if she's becoming unlapsed yeah which is yeah, a, a term i had to go look up because i was like what in the world uh <laughs> i was like oh <laughs> lapsed catholic unlapsed catholic going back uh <laughs> you know do you believe again you're acting as if you believe and i think that's after he discovers a rosary in her house mm. um like you know why do you have this rosary so yeah um what i also like is you know when when you look at most of the films in the series that revolve around this topic um it's always the the hollywood uh showcase um and you know the, there's there's some there's two or three points in the series where they talk about children being possessed and can they be possessed and they say no because in order for a possession to happen the demon has to be invited in and a child can't do that especially a fetus yeah they talk about um, consent um yeah yeah because there's yeah. a fetus an unborn uh very very close to being born like within days that's why there is a time pressure on it that the mm. fetus will be born and the church says that ah, fetus can't invite them in fetus can't consent so it can't be a possession yeah and most other movies and series would just you know like omen for instance with uh damon um yeah damien sorry damien um you know it's a child who's possessed by the devil um so it, it doesn't like tie in with with all the other hollywood's uh phenomena or hollywood bullshit that goes around 
Yeah, I, I liked this show and this season specifically because there were a lot of things in it that I felt were much closer to real life experience, mm -hmm. both with hauntings and demons and with working with the Catholic Church and how they handle possessions and that sort of thing. No, not everything. There's still some Hollywood in there because, oh, yeah, I mean, it's got to be an exciting show, um, mm -hmm. but there's i mean it's not not some of the crazy off the wall stuff where it's just like this is how it works in reality but we don't need that for a plot point so on we go yeah mm -hmm. yeah and also bringing in the lesser key of solomon um but changing it so yeah the 72 demons from the lesser key or goesha it's 60 new ones that they just created well and the seals are very interesting they're mm. i didn't see any seals that i recognized in the brief shots they only focus on a couple of them when they're focusing in on specific demons and their seals um so i didn't like pause the show and go over they show you a whole map eventually where they discover mm. this but and by the way we should say this review is full of spoilers oh my word all the spoilers so if you um, haven't seen the show <laughs> i'm assuming people have seen the show before they watch this yes we'll just put a big spoiler alert in the time right <laughs> um but i didn't i didn't notice any seals that i recognized as oh that's actually in the book that's in mm. you know in the last of solomon or anything like that but they're all very much in the style of mm. you know the the gothic crosses and the arrangement in the circles with the double wall and that sort of thing. Um, and they did a couple of times show the seal redrawn in various ways, which I thought was interesting. Um, it was more the idea of the images in the seal as opposed to copying the exact lines. And you kind of get the idea that, especially with the main demon that they're dealing with, which is possessing, inhabiting, embodying, not sure, another psychologist, Leland Townsend, it's like his signature. And so how he draws it each time is a little different. You know, um, it kind of morphs and changes a little bit. And the one that he draws in the journals he gives to the kids looks like a kid's version of the mm. demon seal. The pig is cute, you know? Yeah. I thought that was really interesting. So it's kind of his signature, but it's also kind of his um, opening doorway to the energies there. And he makes it appealing to the children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the whole point of it. Um, so, the actors in this show, I didn't recognize any of the actors except for Mike Coulter. And he played uh, Luke Cage in the hmm. Luke Cage series and, and in Jessica Jones, of course, where he shows up. And, um, you know, when I saw him come on screen, I'm like, ah, oh, it's the guy who played Luke Cage. But he doesn't look massive and hulking like he does in Luke Cage. He looks you know, much more like a normal sized person. And he really wonderfully plays this priest, well, person who's trying to be a priest, but obviously has some conflict in their past and some issues. And of course, ending up in this assessor job seems kind of personal for him, especially early on. He's tormented by the demon apparently who's there when he's praying and talking to him trying to distract him from his prayers mm. and i thought that portrayal was really awesome um i i have a lot of friends in seminary school um i spent a bit of time in seminary school myself didn't end up going that route uh but uh there are very few people in the priesthood that don't have some kind of weird background like that you know, something brings people to the priesthood. Um, in the church, they say something brings you to God. And that happens in, in all sorts of religion. There is something bad or difficult or difficult to understand 
that brings people to the priesthood and it's always it always comes out in bits and pieces dribs and drabs <laughs> you know it's never oh yeah i'm here because uh you know i was possessed by a demon and accidentally killed my girlfriend none of that happens it's just these little bits and very much trying not to talk about it very mm. much you know this is not something i need to bring to people this is my own personal struggle uh so i thought that was surprisingly accurate and i kind of wonder if the showrunners or the writers were in seminary or have a friend or a family member in the seminary or something like that you know because i thought I that was surprisingly good for how that yeah, went I think, I think they've definitely got a, a close connection with somebody i mean it is that whole thing of um he doesn't want to talk about it because that's in the past right this is now his new life you know so you know that's gone he doesn't want to go there anymore he doesn't want to talk about it he doesn't want to think about it but at the same time it keeps coming up um because he started off where he um had visions of god and then the vision stopped so he starts taking um not sure what mushrooms they were but he oh, starts taking psilocybin caps that was psilocybin yeah yeah, yeah he takes psilocybin um, and it, oh my word the amount in that cup I oh, know, it was packed. <laughs> I mean, I understand it was for the show. They wanted to make sure that you could see what was going on. But, <laughs> wow, that was a massive dosage. <laughs> uh, so, warning to everybody, if you're going to watch the show and try to decide, don't put that much in the cup. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not real sure he drank it all, because he makes a, a coffee mug a, of tea but and mm. takes a couple sips and then he's carrying the full cup while he goes to lay down and then has the visions but it's clear that this is something he's done many times before he goes mm. to the drug dealer at the club the club the guy knows him and asks where his girlfriend is and then just immediately rolls open his stash and is like what do you want mm. you know so this is not something new he's used this to see God and when we meet uh David Acosta's father who lives on a mm. commune and they regularly drink psychoactive wine and have these big parties so they can commune with divinity it's clear that like this is this is not new to his life maybe he grew up this way or maybe it's something that they both found later in life but that's a normal function in his life of using that to commune with God and notably the people in the church that know he sees visions which seems to be common knowledge because there are several other priests that talk about you know Acosta has visions they don't admonish him for the drug use so either they don't know no, I don't think they do or they don't care because his visions seem to be a good thing to the church you know what i was getting what i was getting was his original vision um was not uh drug induced or anything like that i think it was, it was some kind of natural phenomenon that happened to him and then he's chasing it yeah he's so trying kind of, to get that to get first back. experience back mm. yeah yeah um and then it was also the uh the ex-girlfriend or fiance's sister yes so at yeah. first acosta is talking about his friend julia he doesn't refer to her as girlfriend when uh kristen is asking about things and he's like you know she's gone now that's all mm. he says he, he's he doesn't say much about it he doesn't you know intimate and then when her sister comes she's like oh yeah they were very very close uh uh they were engaged to be married because a couple of times david calls her my fiance mm. and so you know and they they mentioned that julia is the one that got them both involved with the church because now yeah. her sister is a lawyer for the church mm. so yeah something happened there julia Julia is who got them to that point, to being yeah. 
involved. But it was, it's also the um, part where the sister actually seduces him. Mm, um, yeah. No, it, it just it brings out the reality of, of the situation. Um, you know, nobody's perfect. People are going to make mistakes all the time. And it comes into play with, with this series, I think, quite a lot, actually. Yeah, there's a lot of points where David Acosta, as um, an aspiring priest, struggles with attraction and sexuality and, and that sort mm. of thing. And obviously is, you know, working through uh, his vows of celibacy and what that's going to take out of him. So. Mm. And uh, then the horned man. Love him. <laughs> yeah, at the at the very end, I was kind of surprised to see like here's an actual figure. Mm. You know, I was like, oh, you sitting there, sitting there as a psychologist, right? Taking notes. <laughs> Townsend goes to him like a psychologist, or uh, I I got it very much like reporting to his boss. Mm. You know, here's a review on the work you were assigned to do. How's it going? and uh you know reporting everything that's going on and his boss turns out to be a goat lord basically big hairy horn guy and then all of a sudden this goat lord is in uh, Kristen's house and all sorts of other places too once he's mm -hmm. revealed he's everywhere you know when he's when he's in Kristen's house in well, Walnut during the dream, she's having a lucid dream and she's um, basically overcoming George and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then he pops up as a new character, which freaks her out because she doesn't, she, this is new to her. Mm -hmm. There's something he says to her and I can't quite remember it. It was um, something along the lines of, now we can start the proper work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's something um, opening like that. Of, oh, now we can begin. Yeah, so there's something down the line in, in the next season or possibly even further than that I think is going to come out, which is going to be quite interesting. Um, so I, I did start watching season two, so I'm just trying to make, make sure that I don't get things yeah, overlapped. Yeah, I, I did not start season two I on know. purpose because I don't want to <laughs> bleed yeah, into other things. I started watching it before you actually mentioned doing this. So, oh, oh. Um, the uh artificial insemination was that that was part of season one yeah they just pick up on that they put together that um something's happening there at that clinic and part of it is the eulers triangle keeps showing up uh which mm. is uh david has a vision with the mushrooms that involves uh the eulers triangle that he finds in a vision from da Vinci's work, Salvatore Monday, uh, the savior mm -hmm. of the world. And then through, um, you know, uh, tech uh, cutscene, what do they call those? Montage. He pieces mm -hmm. together uh, with some other visions he's had. He does sketches of them. He pieces together that, you know, this refers to New York and Chicago and D.C. and lines it up on the map. And uh, it's just like, that part, that's too fast. That's like, okay. that's like the hackers that sit down and they're like, I'm in, you know, on movies because we just don't have time to watch all of that. Um, I, was, I, was, I was trying to figure out how you got the scales right on the map and right. the, the yeah, just, dots. Yeah, it's like. Perfectly line up. <laughs> oh, he thinks to look longitude and latitude. Okay, cool. But he got the numbers right the first time right mm. picked longitude and latitude correctly and that lines up to new york i think it is it's a new york or washington yeah. dc as his first point and then he all of a sudden just da -da, oh i'll copy paste this image from salvatore monday and those little white dots are stars you know mm. and there's debate in the art world that those are stars or those are paint flecks like they're not mm even supposed to be there they're bits of the paint cracking off so mm. you know um 
but like just immediately he pastes it over and rotates it and it lines up the scales perfect everything is just lined up right away that is no. not how that works in real life <laughs> no, i've tried doing that it don't work but they also probably didn't have time for two hours worth of no. mm -hmm. crazy scribbling and notebooks and what the hell and da 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 but I thought that was a good illustration of something that uh, the priest, I think the Monsignor said earlier, or one of the priest advisors that Acosta goes to for help about his visions. And he's basically like, you know, one, how do I get them back? He's, he's wanting visions again. He's wanting to communicate with God again. Um, mm. And two, how do I know which ones are real? Mm. And the priest says, write everything down. First off, mm. everything, just write it down, everything. He emphasizes that. And then he says, God draws in straight lines and the devil reveals himself in patterns. Mm. Which I thought was really interesting. And obviously one of the core bases for this show that they're going to use those patterns and those cycles to point to evil stuff, devil stuff, and stuff that is not like that to point to God stuff. But I don't know that that necessarily holds outside of the show world because I've heard several times that, you know, the mystery of God is in the patterns. Mm. Um, the divine signature is one of those things. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess, rationales or um, theories of knowledge about how um, herbs look like what they're used for. Lungwort looks like lungs. Uh, deer tongue that is used for helping with circulation has red veins through it. You know, that's that's the divine signature, the doctrine of signatures. And mm. the idea is the patterns repeat themselves and that's how you know God made it. God signed these things with the information. So, you know, that whole, the devil is in patterns and, and God draws in straight lines, I don't think translates over into the real world, but it's an interesting uh, premise for the development of the show how they keep seeing these patterns and they're finding things again and again, especially David, because he's the one having the visions and kind of piecing all of these bits together as he goes. Mm. Kristen seems to be pretty bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for a psychologist, yeah. Um, I did find, that going back to that scene where um, <clears throat> the horn man is standing in Kristen's house and he says something to the lines of, um, now we can start the, the proper work. I, it felt to me almost like um, that character was not the evil, but it was also not the good. It was more of a balanced type of character. Mm. But right in the beginning, he's being portrayed as the the devil the, or Satan or, you know, the, the leader of these demons. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it just... He keeps feeling like this neutral aspect. Like a Baphomet. Yeah, basically, yeah. Well, so that's why I keep thinking later along the line, there's something that something's going to come out that kind of brings it all together and balances everything. The depiction is very much like a Baphomet, too. And, mm. you know, I don't know. I would imagine that a big hairy goat lord with horns in pop culture TV is going to end up being, say, I mean, uh, you know, there's been lots of pop culture TV exploring all of these ideas, heaven and hell and demons and angels and Satan, and there's a whole Lucifer series and that sort of thing. But there's some tropes that they just go back to again and again and again. You yeah, know, I've, I've got a feeling this series is going to break away, away from all that pop culture stuff. We'll have to see I how mean, it they, goes. I mean... During all of the possessions, infestations, and everything else, there is no mention of uh, Beelzebub, of um, any of the normal demons that all of the other programs and, and movies actually, you know, just kind of blurt out every time. Yeah, the, the names are not 
not a big thing. And I wonder if that's because they're focusing on the 60, which mm. is this, this group of demons in this particular prophecy that uh, David seems to be involved with somehow. And they all seem to work together. Because there's one point where Townsend says, oh, it's one of the other 59 people I trust in this world. You mm. know? Um, so it's clear that they're all related and working together. And the map that they show has a bunch of lines between them. And one of the missing points seems to be a key uh, point of relationships between them about how they work together that they will need to figure out. Uh, but I, I wonder if it's because of that they're not using regular demon names or if it's because those are just too played out for where they want to go with this show. Mm, you know? Because okay. um, yeah. the 60 is not something I've ever come across in demon lore. Or, no. you know, those sigils aren't familiar. I think those are all made up for this show. Unless it really is some secret document in the Vatican. <laughs> mm, I, doubt, I doubt it. I doubt it too. <laughs> um, you know... <laughs> to light at some point before it got made into a series i'm sure yeah i did see yeah. this described the show described as um the da vinci code meets the x files and i thought okay. that was cute because it mm -hmm. does have that da vinci code flavor of vatican secrets and you know assessors and priests and and possessions immediately into this catholic worldview of the great battle between heaven and hell between God and the devil and all these mm. demons running around doing things, you know, um, yeah. I don't know about the X-Files bit, but <clears throat> unless it's yeah. just the slow conversion of belief, that seems to be kind of the arc of the first season is, is Kristen, the psychologist starts out as, I don't believe in any of this stuff. You know, she, she goes back to, there is a rational explanation as if rationality and spirituality are, two ends of a spectrum and never the twain shall meet you know mm. um and when she's talking to her own psychologist in appointments he's very much of that attitude also that oh well well that's all just make-believe you know there's reality over here that is psychology and that sort of thing and slowly as Kristen has more and more experiences and more and more encounters she starts acting as if they are true she believes the prophet they go and see that tells her to avoid red mm. you know um she starts believing that townsend is a demon not just a, a psychologist after her she picks that one up pretty mm. early mm. you know mm. um she doesn't necessarily pick up a uh, belief in possession itself the way the church views it and the way they're acting during the exorcisms but she becomes more and more acting on well what if it could be real mm. and ben as a foil does not he continues with the non-church worldview explanations of things even though um there's the episode that kind of focuses on him where he goes on the ghost hunting show and he admits sure there are things he can't explain you mm. know and that video really really <laughs> got his head around it where there's the angel and he's like yeah. I, I don't know couldn't explain that, i couldn't explain it and at one point when um let's see the broadway director seems to be possessed but it turns out it's an assistant he pissed off who's hacking his virtual assistant and decided to fuck with him and, you know, uh, put it in his head that he was making a deal with the devil. That jumps to a thing at home and his sister started working on it because she seems to be a better tech guru than he is. Mm -hmm. When he has a problem, he goes to his sister and says, help me with this tech stuff. She can reverse hacks and all sorts of things with just clickety click and done. Um, <laughs> but the, the entity Joe, that seems to be the demon that the assistant made up, jumps mm. to his home virtual assistant 
after the uh, human person says, no, I quit doing that. Yeah. You know, I, I fucked with him. I got my revenge. I, I quit. And Ben doesn't know what to do. He's panicking. Mm -hmm. His sister is obviously panicking because here is this um, disembodied voice talking through the virtual assistant in Urdu about what happened to the baby she had. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like she hadn't told uh, Ben either. Well, no. Quite clearly, she's an unmarried woman. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how this all played out and that the the she left and abandoned this baby and left it for dead and everything else. And he just grabs it and goes and tosses it in a trash compactor. Mm -hmm. Not let me find a rational explanation. Not this has got to be some hack, but get rid of this. And then it doesn't come up again, at least in season one. But, you know, I can't imagine they're going to let that big, huge loophole drop. I don't know. We'll mm. see. I, I'm looking yeah, forward to seeing where a lot of these open-ended questions go. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, even when he when he says that there's things he can't explain, he still doesn't uh, believe. Um, no. He doesn't doubt that there is a some kind of technical explanation and physical explanation to it. He just hasn't found it yet. Yeah. And he just... That's, that's his take. Yeah. There's got to be something. I just don't know what it is. But someone does. You yeah. know, there's an explanation out there. But really, when when that scene, when he goes to toss the virtual assistant in the trash compactor, you see fear and panic on his face. Yeah. Like, oh my god, I don't know what to do. And then he tosses it in the trash compactor. Everything ends. You know, it gets crushed. And you can watch him be like, well, what the fuck did I just do? Now I can't mm. solve it. Mm. You know? A bit of doubt might have also crept in there. Yeah. So I thought I, I thought that was really an interesting scene. And hella kudos to the actors. Um, let's mm. see, that's Asif Mandvi, who plays Ben Shakir. Uh, the three leads in this show, I think... They're doing wonderful. And I went yeah. and looked. And they have like a different director for nearly every episode. So it's these actors who are doing an amazing job with it. Really mm -hmm. registering these emotions. And the complexity that goes on. And the seemingly irrational actions that a lot of people take in these situations. Where I don't believe, I don't believe. But what if? And you know. Because mm. it's the only explanation that's offered. So we seize upon it as well, just in case. Yeah. I'd actually love to read one of the scripts and see how they actually write mm. um, the four girls. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the four kids, girls yeah. are great. They're... Because they just, they just like come in and it's just all of them talking at the same time. I mean, how do you write a script like that? They're just a force of <laughs> chaos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I, well, every once in a while, some lines emerge above the babble, you know, mm. that you can pick up. But the the little girls are amazing. And yeah. they, they play it really well, too, mm. about how involved but also not involved their mom is. And, of course, for the good chunk of the series, their dad is away on Mount Everest uh, doing tours. So he's not there at first. And they kind of make fun of that. There's a lot of points where they make fun of these tropes, these horror mm. story tropes. Um, and they, they're watching a horror movie. Mom is watching a horror movie with the girls. And she's like, where's the mom? And they're like, oh, she's dead. She died in a car crash. And she's like, of course she's dead. Hollywood hates moms. Mm. But, you know, so many horror stories are set up with a single parent. Because they're not around all the time. You know, they have to work and be home and so on and so forth. So there's an opportunity for the horror story to unfold, the evil to invade, whatever it is. And they directly poke fun at that in the show, but they use it anyways. Yeah. You know, because Townsend starts dating their grandma, who is their regular babysitter. 
Uh, their grandma is rather uninvolved in the babysitting process. She's off doing other things. She's not paying attention. She's just kind of like, oh, whatever you're doing, you know, and especially where they run off on Halloween night uh, with the demonic little girl, I guess. I'm not sure what to call it. Not Brenda. Yeah, I don't know who she, I don't know what happened to her or where she came from or who, but that's just a complete mystery as well. Yeah. Because then she, she clears off and she's walking down the street, scares some kid and laughs her way down the street and that's it. She's gone. I mean, where the, yeah, that's <laughs> it. That was where'd the only, she come from? where'd she go? You know, only bit of that, but I thought that was really clever. Um, definitely some Alfred Hitchcock kind of nods of, we never see her face. Even though she's talking about having a horribly burned face and you think she's going to lift the mask and we're going to see this crazy gory thing. But the cuts are such that we never see it. And, you know, the monster you don't see is scarier than the one you do. Mm. And I thought at first in the show we weren't going to see George. Her yeah. succubus, incubus, uh, nightmare <laughs> demon. You know, but he gets seen in, in full glory, very detailed and everything else. And then they explain that away by, oh, he was in a uh, the horror show they were watching with the missing mom. So that's where mm -hmm. they saw it. Except that um, when they when she actually shows the kids, the, um, the, the guy that acts as the monster, as uh, the character George, um, the... I don't know if it was the director or, or, or whoever, the, the screenwriter, whoever it was, actually said that he gets his ideas from his dreams. Right. These things come to so, me in my dreams. And so yeah. then I go make a very quick model and then translate it. I noticed that. I thought that was really good. And but... there, was, there, was also, there was also a tie over with um, Kristen's finger, again, the, the demon George um, cutting his, the finger off. Mm -hmm. And then the daughter later saying, I also had a, I had a dream where, where this demon was cutting my finger off. So it's exactly the same dream as well, no. but they hadn't spoken about it. So <clears throat> whether this demon George is actually real or not is also a mystery. So yeah. we've got all, all things in there, which are fantastic. But they yeah. talk about night terrors, about how she can't move anything but her eyes, which is, you know, that's the experience of night terrors. Paralysis has happened, mm. but the brain is still awake, you know. But that shared dreams between parents and kids, that's also a real phenomenon that happens mm. frequently um, and is cause for calling for investigations or exorcisms or cleansings, that sort of thing. Um, I shared dreams with my father um, the entire time I lived with my parents. Mm. Uh, they faded five, six years after I moved out. Uh, but still, I can pick up when my father has very intense dreams and vice versa. My father calls me when I have terrible nightmares. And he's like, hey, that was really a rough night. You doing okay? Mm. So, you know, that... They don't try to explain that away, which I thought was a, a good point about the show. It's just mm. taken as granted that there is this connection there and they're sharing dreams. But it's not all the kids. It's just one of them. Yeah. And then later on, there's the inclusion of Buddhism. Uh, when the father comes back and he's um, experimenting with Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then one of the daughters has to go in for uh, her heart operation because of valves or something have deteriorated mm -hmm. and the kids are sitting in the the other kids are sitting in the waiting room and they are doing the chant that they heard their father do and the doctor comes along and says you can't explain it but it was like a miracle cure so it it's great that it's not just focused on you know christianity and catholicism is the only only uh, uh path and the only tradition only religion yeah. There's others that can do good as well. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, which and it's, is a, great. it's amazing how fast the kids pick that up. It's mm. like, he's stressed out, so he goes and starts chanting to calm himself down. And he does his mudras and his meditation. And he doesn't realize that one of the girls sees him do it. They, like, peek in on the door, realize he's busy, and leave. And then, like, the next scene, the girls are all chanting perfectly. Mm. <laughs> 
<laughs> like they got the words right and everything. So, yeah. yeah. It was in the script. <laughs> right, it was in the script. That's how they knew what to chant. Um, but yeah, they picked it up so fast and they did it so perfectly. I thought that was like that's that's not how that works. I mean, yes, kids imitate absolutely, but they don't get it right. No. <laughs> not on the first shot. So. Yeah, but it made a great scene anyway. Yeah. That's, that's the whole thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah. There's gonna, there's obviously gonna be some things that they have to put in there, which uh, are a bit uh, above board or a bit over the top, but you know, gotta but, put them in there for the entertainment. But way back when they talked to the lady that was doing the prophecies, where they had to go assess the prophecies, and they first discovered this secret document from the Vatican, Kristen mm. Bouchard did ask about her daughter and her heart valve. And the reply was, she will heal. Mm. And then, you know, the rest of the scene was being upset about the method the prophet used to deliver all of this and how she was blowing up these toys and it was inane and everything else. But, you know, they did, they did allude to that, like, she's going to be fine. God already said. Mm. Yeah, so there is that as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the question is the path or the route that it took for her to be fine. Because, I mean, the one minute the doctor's saying, you've got to bring her in immediately, it's an emergency operation we've got to do, and the next minute he goes yeah. into cut, and there's nothing wrong. Everything's they, healed. They did the yeah. scope. He determined operation now. Like, no choice mm. today. And he, you know, we can't wait. we got to do this. And then they go in to do the operation, and it healed and he's like i don't know what happened in like four hours mm. and of course the the doctor says it's a miracle but he also says young bodies do weird things mm. you know and they use that explanation for the girl who died and spontaneously revived three hours later after being blessed by the priest as a miracle we don't know young bodies are weird mm. they do weird things and I think it's interesting that they're using that very common experience of young children, over seven, under 16, that range where um, adolescence kicks in and weird stuff happens. Mm. Uh, because, you know, in hauntings and possessions and exorcisms and everything else, Nine times out of ten, there's a kid involved. Uh, and, and the activity centers around that kid. Uh, going through that time period, going through adolescence, wakes up all this stuff. And without, you know, information about how to control it or what's happening or what to do with it. Or how to be safe when talking to entities and, and that sort of thing. Shit goes off, you know. Mm. And so I thought... The fact that they keep coming back to that again and again was very noteworthy. And I was kind of disappointed um, towards the end of the story arc when they were like, oh, it's all these kids because it's through this in vitro clinic. It's through this fertility clinic. And the demons are influencing the eggs before they're implanted. That's what's mm. going on. You know, and Kristen gets freaked out because the daughter with the heart condition she had through this clinic. Yeah, I think the one thing I can't quite figure out is um, specifically Leland, if he is possessed by the demon that he is representing or whether he's just like acting on behalf of. Um, because, you know, sometimes it, he comes across as this demonic force. So at some stage he got possessed and the demon is riding his body. Um, and then there's, there's, there's a part where um, Kristen and, and Neeland are in the court and she 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 retaliates because he yeah. comes at her and she retaliates carrying on about his past and he was this stupid little kid and everything else. And he, he felt attacked. Now, if he wasn't the, the, the demon possessing a body or if he was, then that wouldn't really matter to him. Um, but he clearly felt attacked, so he was still that that person that he that, that Christian was saying he was in his past life. So I can't quite 
put that bit together. Well, so I guess we'll find out. I don't think it's what would be classed as a possession because especially in, in the view of the Catholic Church, possession deteriorates the body over time. Demons can't mm -hmm. just hang out in bodies for a long period of time. Stuff falls apart. Uh, they don't, it doesn't work. And it's more like uh, the possession in the supernatural TV show where a demon mm -hmm. just moves in and takes over a body and continues to do their demonic work that way and nothing's wrong. But yeah, when she comes back and attacks him, about marching band and that sort of thing. And then we see him go to his boss psychologist, Goat Lord dude, and, you know, talk about it and process this stuff. Like, well, it makes me feel bad and it makes me feel impotent. And it's the same stuff he was using on the uh, young man to try to turn him into a violent incel. The same mm. psychology. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. But my thought was back at the beginning of the show, when we first encounter Townsend, Acosta explains it as, you know, even if you don't believe in demons, you know that there are influencers in the world, people that encourage other people to do bad things, mm. you know, that influence people one way or the other. And Richard says, yeah, psychopaths. And, like, mm -hmm. they agree and on they go. But, so I wonder if it's some understanding of demons walk amongst us kind of thing. You know, that it's just, they had to grow up, they had to be somewhere, and this, this experience, this demeaning experience through high school and that sort of thing was part of the process not necessarily human entity and demon moves in, but this is the demon having a physical manifestation. Yeah, or Be person becoming a psychopath, and therefore yeah. we speak about demons. Yeah, a there's demons. I think yeah. this show does a very good job of lining up a bunch of psychological explanations parallel with spiritual explanations. Hmm. These are the steps that a person becomes a psychopath. Well, these are the steps that we figure out they're a demon. Hmm. You know, and it makes me think of the, at least psychology now says, oh, back in the 1500s, all these things were happening. We just didn't have the tools to explain it. So people use spirituality to explain it. And I think hmm. um, Dr. Boggs, the psychologist that Bouchard sees, he even uses that kind of rationale one time when he talks about his cultural trip to Bali, you know, and and how it's it's an explanation for this phenomenon that is repeatedly occurring. So we see these mm. parallels happen. But there's also the interesting thing when Townsend and Bouchard have that confrontation outside the court and she records him. Yeah. Because she records the conversation and the things he says that are innocuous get recorded. But the things he said that are obviously like his demonic plan being revealed, you know, where he talks about why he's sending this young child to prison so he can become who he needs to be. Those don't get mm. recorded. And Ben yeah. is like, oh, they used a jammer. Let me unscramble the signal. He ultimately can't. And they end up deep faking it in the court to save this kid. But that story of this influence will lead him down this path to become who he is meant to be. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of Townsend's story that he went through this path to become who he is meant to be. Yeah, to become this influencer. Yeah. But then, as, as you say, I mean, there's the parts of his conversation on the recording are, are scratched. Um, like you can't hear them but right at the beginning of the recording when he says something like hello how are you type thing right. that's there so there's obviously not some kind of technical problem there it's not a blocker or anything because otherwise the whole conversation would have been blocked up right and and ben works on it to uncover what was said and he can't mm -hmm. you know so because it's a pressing time issue they come up with another solution but I thought that was an interesting way to look at 
the machinations of the demons and their use of prisons and courts and everything else, you can't present their crap as evidence in court because they've taken precautions against the technology, mm. you know, which is something that comes up a lot in assessments and exorcisms and stuff like that. People will tell you of all these things that happen, but they don't have any evidence because they can't get recordings. Oh, the tape failed. Uh, my phone mm. broke. The files mysteriously disappeared. The whole thing is static. You know, the notebook I had where I wrote everything down was the only thing that caught fire. You know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Mm. That occurs quite frequently in real life. And mm. a lot of skeptics will be like, well, there was no evidence. They're making it up. And there are excuses. But you have to wonder when it happens again and again and again and you hear these stories over and over again, if it's just people making it up all the time. Or if there is something happening there. Yeah. I suppose I should also say, because anybody who's heard my stuff is probably sitting there going, oh, but Lee keeps saying that demons don't possess people. It's, the, it's others and astral parasites and things like that. It's a TV show, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do not use the word demon the way we use the word demon. No. Uh, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. But mm. this whole show is set in the Catholic worldview. That's the premise from the get-go. And they define that mm. quite clearly by the main character being an aspiring priest. Mm. You know, he is he is moving from a mundane worldview of complete skepticism and materialism into the Catholic worldview where possessions and hauntings and... and God versus devil happens. And he's much further into it than Bouchard is. And Ben's still way over here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, in the materialistic worldview of there's a, a rational explanation for everything. But, mm, but go ahead. But having, having said that, I mean, yeah, it is, it is mostly from a Christian or Catholic, uh, Catholic point of view. But as we said, they also like they bring in different religions as well uh, and they don't completely reject them um, I'm not going to say what happens in season two but there's a definite there's a there's a there's a part in there that just makes that apparent um, they don't reject those religions it's it's kind of more, more like viewing it as a synthesis um, you know we're all working together type thing to try and make a better world well um, I, I think that is part of the Catholic worldview though um, okay. um, talking to, to nuns and monks and priests and working um, with assessors and, and having been present for exorcisms, they don't deny that other religions exist. They don't deny that there are other spiritual technologies. Um, mm. They think they're right, but yeah. they think that other people are totally capable of doing all of these things and interacting with these demons and so on and so forth. And that there are even Catholic priests who will be like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a thing that happens in that religion and that's their demons. Mm. So I, I think that is part of the Catholic worldview um, that other technologies exist, spiritual technologies that, you know, there are even other entities that are outside of Catholicism. They still have an omnipotent, omnipresent God that is everything but more of a let's save people and work together and if the catholic priest can't do the exorcism but you know a tinglet shaman can then do that because it's mm. more important to save souls yeah and yeah. and save the people yeah and that was that was the whole thing you were saying earlier about um uh Kristen, you know going to the monsignor and saying you know you can do something now, go do it, otherwise people are going to die. Um, if we involve psychology into it, it could be weeks or two weeks down the line, you know, because it's just going to take too long. You can act now, go and do it. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Just save someone's life. You know. There was one bit in episode like four or five when they're doing the exorcism and it's Kristen's first exorcism. David calls her and he's like, shit is going down. 
I need help. Um, mm. We already had an assessment. They determined it was a possession. We did an exorcism, but now this exorcism is dragging on and on and on. Something's wrong. We want another assessment. And he calls Ben too, but Ben is doing the ghost show. And mm. so he can't be there. And that's Halloween night because that's when Kristen's away and the kids go to the uh, cemetery. They try to bury one of the kids in a fresh grave. And who leaves a freshly dug grave open on Halloween night in an unlocked cemetery? Total horror show script. Not, not a thing. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is to get into cemeteries at night, especially on Halloween? It's a lot of work. A little group of loud children did not accomplish that. Anyways, <laughs> um, so they go to the exorcism. Kristen is, of course, overwhelmed. And, I mean, as are pretty much everyone at their first exorcism, it's, it's an experience. And this is a bad one. Things are not mm. going well. Um, you know, the woman is pleading and sweating and, you know, she's asking the priest, how long has she been tied up in that bed? And is she eating and everything else? And the priest's explanation is when the demon rests, she can be human. But then the demon returns and then she vomits and everything else, which is kind of an explanation perhaps for what's going on with Townsend. He's just mm. cool with the possession. He's not fighting it. I don't know. Maybe. But anyways, that night, she calls her doctor, uh, her psychologist, Kurt, and says, come help. I need another doctor here. You know, mm. she doesn't identify as a doctor, even though she is a doctor. She uses it in court when it needs leverage. And he comes, and they do the, the scene from The Exorcist. <laughs> I mean, the fog and the lamp and everything else, and he's holding the briefcase, you know, <laughs> and it's really cute. And he goes in, and, and the exorcism happens, and it, it works eventually because David prays. David does what he's not supposed to do. He takes off the sunglasses. He makes eye contact, and he convinces the person to drive out the demon, which is how a lot of exorcisms actually go. Mm -hmm. Um, you see a lot of exorcisms where the priest is all, you know, I compel you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, so on and so forth. And it's like the priest battling the demon and their wills. But in at least the exorcisms I've been involved in that involve the church and many others that don't, it's not those two wills that are in conflict. It's the person who is possessed and the entity possessing them. And you have to build that person back up strong enough that they can finally win, which is hard to do mm. after a long possession. But anyways, mm. they finally win. The woman drives out the demon. They get back. And David walks out, and he stands by that same street lamp. And we watch the fog move away, and then the street lamp break and catch on fire. Mm. So, like, it's an old gas lamp which is weird because this is clearly modern day. There are fertility clinics, right? And computers and hacking virtual assistants. But this is a gas lamp that caught on fire. There are flames coming out the side of the, the lamp. Mm. And he looks at that and something comes over him. I can't quite tell what he's supposed to be conveying. Like, is it doubt? Is it relief? Whatever, but that's the exorcism that they come back and try to sue the church for. Yeah. And they say, oh, it turns out she wasn't possessed. It was all of these psychological things going on. And the church actually caused her damage. And that's how Julia's sister, the lawyer, gets involved. Mm -hmm. And we find out all sorts of stuff about David and mm -hmm. his background and that sort of thing. Yeah, wasn't that whole street lamp thing also in The Exorcist? Mm hmm Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, but I thought that was her first exorcism and uh, Kurt's first exorcism. They use all of those tropes from The Exorcist, and I thought it was great, uh, you know. Mm. Uh, I wonder if there's others in there that I missed. That one I picked up on quickly because I'm a big fan of The Exorcist movies. I think they are hilarious. And mm. I love to watch them, especially around Halloween, and just, just laugh my ass off. 
we have the the Christ compels you joke, you know, uh, throwing water at each other and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> but that's what happens when you live with someone who does exorcisms. They, <laughs> you have to have a lighthearted attitude about them because they're not oh, lighthearted oh, yeah. experiences. Yeah. But I thought that was interesting that they're poking mm. fun at these tropes that are in horror movies, but still they're having a really serious conversation in this show mm. about uh, psychology versus spirituality and that materialistic uh, skeptic viewpoint versus the church's viewpoint and what's really happening, you know, um, trying to uncover that. The one of the demons they pick up has made the video game that the girls are playing yeah you know mm -hmm. and is apparently personally interacting with the girls so there's no that that, that was a um was it demonic or was it just a psychopath it was uh one of the guys who was a game oh maybe he wasn't one of the demons that was yeah. playing the rose 390 or whatever it was the number yeah they eventually found him um i think he was just insane actually yeah and yeah. like LaRue, he appears to be working for Townsend, but Townsend also refers to him as one of the 59. So maybe mm -hmm. he's a fellow demon, maybe he's just a psychopath. I don't know. It's kind of murky, which is, you know, one of the things that I think makes it fairly real. Yeah. Clear cut lines like that rarely emerge because you're totally not getting all of the information. Yeah, yeah. So, I I think that's that's interesting in there. But overall, it's a good show. Um, mm. There's there's of course Hollywood stuff that's played up a little bit, and um, you know, especially the dream sequences. This is a problem with television. You want to show the dream and what's happening, but dreams don't have that real life quality to them. No, they just have so sure that, yeah they have that intuitive mm. knowing and that sort of thing and things aren't that clear you know like the first dream that Kristen has where George goes over and pees on the floor and she wakes up and she looks for that as evidence evidence material evidence of this dream and she finds the water on the floor and she's like oh shit it's real ah and then she notices the window is open and it's raining and that mm. makes her go no it's not real so it immediately sets up this dichotomy that if there's some other explanation then it can't be spiritual or demonic you know mm. which i don't think is true yeah when it comes to to the actual world of course stuff has to manifest physically there has to be there has to be a chain of events that makes things manifest physically. We totally get that weird hairs on the back of our neck sensation when we don't have a quote unquote rational explanation for it. But I don't think the rational explanation negates the spiritual explanation, the way they set it yeah. up in this show. But that would be the viewpoint of a psychologist. It has to be one or the other and the psychologist would go with the scientific explanation but that's also the um, viewpoint of the church in this show yeah the monsignor wants these scientific explanations to discount uh, to rule out prophecy or miracle or possession or whatever it is mm. yeah. and i think that's the position of, of a lot of things or a lot of people mm. in in our modern world the the dichotomy between materialism and spiritualism but overall i think it's a good show it has a lot of uh, things that i find fairly true to life um mm. as far as many of these experiences go it's still got plenty of jump scares in it it's still a horror show that's got you know um some really cool special effects um when uh, Kristen and David are at her dad's commune and they end up drugging them on something in the wine, Molly or something. I don't remember what it is they put in the wine. 
and they're yeah. both, you know, really, really high, and they didn't realize they were. And she goes out to the field, and the woman gives birth to some demon gremlin thing. Uh, yeah. You know, that's pretty. Unless, unless you see that as well. Yeah, you actually <laughs> see that. That's pretty overwhelming, but I get the sense because you actually see the demon that it's like her dreams. You know, mm -hmm. she's tripping on drugs. And so this is like in the dream realm where she actually sees these things. When she's in the not dream realm or the not drugged up realm, we don't see the demons. We don't see them manifest, which I think mm -hmm. is very interesting. You know, we see things like the avatar in the haunted girl game or just Leland Townsend looking like a normal, ugly white guy, you know, uh, very frumpy and just unsuspecting, shuffling along mm. at his job. You know, we don't see demons and, and incubi and, and stuff like that running around in the materialist world. Obviously, the lines are a bit blurred. There's no special effects to be like, oh, this is real and this is not. Mm. But we only see these grotesque demons and these depictions and even uh, the goat boss lord dude in these dream states or in these altered states. Except with Leland at the end. Can't quite figure out if that's a dream state or not. Well, that's not something that any of the three main characters are seeing. Kristen, David, or mm. Ben. That's not their experience. So that's like Townsend experience and he's already a demon. So mm. that could be his dreams and him communing with his guiding power kind of thing. Mm. Or, you know, but even like when David is praying and Leland is there, we don't see him as a grotesque figure. Yeah. It's not an altered state. And we get the sense that Leland maybe isn't there. He's just in David's head. But how do you yeah. depict that on the screen? You know, there are yeah. limits to yeah. the medium, of course. Yeah. And then, oh, there's that one bit when David is, is tripping on drugs. He's in his room at the seminary. And Kristen comes by. She wants to talk to him. She can't get a hold of him because, of course, he's turned off his phone. He's decided to go on a trip. And she comes in, tries to talk to him, and is like, oh, you're, you're fucked up. I'll leave. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, something's wrong. She didn't really address mm -hmm. it, but she's like, I got to get out of here. This is not, I can't have this conversation. And then he turns mm -hmm. around, and there's this shadowy little figure in his chair, in his room. And he I just goes, that. who are you? And that's the end of the episode. And mm. we never see that shadowy little figure again. And yeah, it's 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 posed and up like this, but we don't see any face. And I thought that was really cute because I've seen little shadowy figures like that posed and up mm. like that in the corner rooms and shit. But I thought, wow, the demon got into the church because he lives in a church. It should be blessed ground, right? Should be sanctuary. Mm. But... Mm he's in that altered state and he's seeing weird things and and he's not scared by it mm. he doesn't freak out he's just like ah who are you you know hey <laughs> bet you at the party what's your name you're pretty cool yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're using uh, a really good mix of of visuals and keeping things creepy yeah well, they, def they, they definitely did a good job with this one, I must say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember st when I started watching, I thought, oh, it's going to be one of these again. You know, pro-Catholic church type things, but I was surprised. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I know I know we're not necessarily talking about other shows, but, you know, I really enjoyed Supernatural until mm. we got to the seasons that were just eternal heaven and hell, angel and demon battles. And then I'm just like... Uh, come on. There are other things in the world. You've been with yeah. other things in the world. Why are we in this? You know, we've spent like four seasons in this crazy heaven and hell bullshit. You know. Yeah. Did, did you watch that right to the end? Yeah. And it was just <laughs> a stupid ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I suppose there was, I suppose there was no other way of ending that. After so. 17 seasons, I feel for him. It's a lot of material to come up with and keep that no, that story no. arc fresh. But <laughs> we'll have to do one of these on Supernatural. Just the whole yeah. the whole thing would be good because there's a lot of cool stuff in that. Uh, that when I watched it as someone who you know does cleansing and and deals with hauntings and exorcisms and and that sort of thing i went oh that's real oh wait that's not you know um so i always like those tv shows where i can watch it and be like hey somebody else has been there cool Mm -hmm. and that's what turned me on about this show you know there were a bunch of times where i was like ah that happens oh that happens you know, mm. and you don't see that on all of yeah, them. Yeah. You know, there's mm. not floating little girls in the air spitting pea soup. That none of that's ever happened in my real life experience. Vomiting, sure, but the projectile across <laughs> the room hitting the wall. Uh, blessed Linda Blair. Never seen know. that. I don't know. When my daughter was a baby, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't she in was the a... middle of an exorcism. I mean, if they if they had projectile vomiting at Olympic Games, so she would have entered. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not saying projectile vomiting is not a thing. I also have children. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely has happened, but that's not a common thing in, in exorcisms because the person, by the time you get to a point of an exorcism, the person is weak. Yeah. Very, yeah, very weak. Either, so they've got nothing to actually vomit. Yeah. <laughs> They're usually very dehydrated. They usually haven't been eating. You know, it's, it's not a state of a healthy body uh, by the mm. time you get to that point. Mm. All right. Well, should we wrap it up? I think, we've, I think we've exhausted the evil season one. Yep. Oh, sorry. Not the evil, just evil season one. Um, and anybody who's watching this, please leave us comments. And uh, if you want to know about anything else, just uh, you know, let us know in the comments. Let us know what you thought about this because this is the first one we're doing. So if you want to, if if you've got any suggestions that we can improve, that would be fantastic. And until next time, this was what's on the telly. <laughs> Thank you all for watching, and we will see you on our regular Black Hat chat on Fridays at 4 p.m. GMT. We're on two different channels on Twitch, no, two different channels on YouTube, and we're on Twitch, so all of those links are in our regular descriptions. Yes, and we'll see you there. Bye! Bye Bye-bye!